Joseph, thanks for coming on the show, man. Yeah, good to be here. Yeah, yeah. So it's funny, we were kind of talking about your background a little bit. And I actually, um, my, my first like significant job where I learned a lot was selling uh, animated explainer videos. So we huh. were, I was basically the, the first employee and head of new business at an animation studio called Idea Rocket based in New York. So we would sell like explainers and commercial work and that sort of thing. And uh, it's funny because I was, I was supposed to be in a sales position, but I ended up um, sort of like, like sneaking into the rooms where we were like coming up with metaphors for videos and I was allowed to kind of like <laughs> pitch ideas and stuff. And it was probably completely out of my wheelhouse, but I remember how fun it was to have to come up with these metaphors and everything. Um, so similar space, but different, uh, you know, you're the founder of funny sales videos. And I guess I'd first like to know, like, how did you, um, how did you come to, to that idea? How did you decide to niche towards the funny video space? If that's even a space, you yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, it's becoming one. Um, and I think it's a space that was really invented, if that's the right term to use, by the Harmon brothers, um, you know, with their squatty party, poopery, purple mattress, fiber fix, those videos that just completely blew up the internet and made a lot of agencies sit up and say, huh, you know, let's let's try to follow what they're doing. Um, but to give you a quick background, so 20 years ago, I started um, this agency. It was started under a different name, Procreative Studios. And we started out doing TV commercials and infomercials, so 30-minute long shows um, that uh, you started out being ex extremely um, you know, profitable for our clients. Our very first project was the Little Giant Ladder infomercial that did over $200 million in sales. Um, we were just one small part of the production process, but that kind of you know got me into realizing that if you create some really good content and got a really big audience, you could make millions of dollars. And for about 15 years, that's what we did. TV commercials, TV infomercials, um, and traditional sales videos. So nothing funny. In fact, when the clients would ask me, you know, hey, we've seen this really funny video. Can we do something like that? I would say, sorry, we we don't do funny because you you got to do it well or not at all. And we just didn't have the team of writers, um, which is one of the biggest components, uh, to be able to pull it off well. And so for 15 years, we wouldn't do anything that was uh, that was funny. And it was about five years ago that I really started to look at what Harmon Brothers and some of the other agencies that were doing those kinds of videos were doing to get, you know, millions of views and millions of dollars in sales. And uh, so we finally said, OK, we need to pivot because our clients just weren't getting the results that they used to as TV viewership went down and down and our clients were not seeing the, the kinds of results. and so. Around uh, well, about around three, four years ago is when we enrolled in Harmon Brothers University, which is kind of a mentorship program where you know we paid a decent amount of money to go through and learn everything that they do to get the results that they did. And to give you a contrast, you know, before that, our biggest video online had maybe a hundred thousand, a hundred thousand views, um, and our first campaign after going through. Um, the new Harmon Brothers training, you know, we got between three videos, one campaign, we got 7 million views. Fast forward to today, our latest campaign between two videos has almost 70 million views. So just completely orders of magnitude more results than we, we used to get when we did these straight videos. So it's really just based on the results we're seeing. Yeah, yeah, that, that's interesting. And there, there's there's so much to get into there. Um, I guess one question I have is like, you know, when the Harmon Brothers made the Squatty Potty videos, and then even even before that, like there was this era of viral videos where, you know, maybe like one to five funny videos, whether they were commercials or something else could like really take over the quote unquote collective consciousness online, you know, over YouTube or whatever. And over the last few years, I, I feel like the number of shared experiences, right. has just gotten fragmented. Like, I'm not sure, for example, that there will, there will ever be, you know, a show like breaking bad or game of Thrones anymore. Right. Where everybody tunes in. It's like, I don't know if that's going to happen again. Um, 
but so I'd love to hear your thought, thoughts on that. Like how, how possible do you think it actually is to make a truly viral video now? And what, yeah, what, what, what's your take on shared experience? <laughs> so I, it depends on your definition of a truly viral video. So most people think when they see these videos that have, you know, tens of millions of views, they think they were organic views and nothing could be further from the truth, right? Back in the day when, you know, Dollar Shave Club and some of the early Harmon Brothers videos, the algorithms on these social media platforms hadn't developed enough to realize the difference between, you know, a cat video and a commercial. And these days, you know, things have completely changed. It's impossible, in my opinion, to make a commercial go organically viral because the platforms are smart enough to say, oh, this is a commercial. And if you want to make you know a lot of money from this video you're going to have to pay to show it to the audience rather than just you know rely on organic views in fact i think the harman brothers recently said that you know some of their videos wouldn't have got past you know the, the couple hundred thousand views if they had have just relied on organic organic traffic and so you know the the truth is we don't create viral videos we create videos that when you put it online, promote it with paid ads, it'll be so profitable that you want to continue to pay to, to make those, you know, go to the millions and tens of millions of views. So today it's absolutely possible. In fact, you know, we have a you know pretty good track record. Pretty much every client that we've worked with lately has, you know, gone into the millions of views, but it's about paying to promote those videos. And then the, the returns obviously have to be there for the clients to continue to spend money. It's kind of like a vending machine that's full of $100 bills that cost $20 to use. How many times are you going to use that machine? That's basically yeah. what, we're, what we're creating. I think that's a really good point that I haven't thought about enough where, you know, the fact that we have these like crazy viral mass shared experiences was more a factor of the algorithm being for, focused on organic. And now it's sort of like, it's pay to play. And if you're going to pay to play, like, do you want to be paying for a crap video or one that has the potential to, to do great? Things? Exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. And then you do get, you know, maybe 10% of our views are organically generated because once you get into those millions of views, you know, people will start to see it. If the content is engaging enough, you know, the number of views, the number of shares, the number of comments that will tell the algorithm is this content people like, and then they will, sh you know, make it so that people will want to promote it. So, you know, maybe 90% of our views are paid and 10% kind of the cherry on top are shares that are organic. Yeah. And, and this is kind of going off the reservation a little bit, but I'm wondering like, I, I maybe I'm just nostalgic, but I kind of miss the days when, you know, the, the organic rankings were, were the, the be all end all. Cause I feel like we got a lot better content and now it's like that it's all pay to play. I feel like you don't have that anymore. And also like, it seems like these platforms are, are starting to suffer from it. You know, there's more and more niche platforms springing up. Um, I feel like the, the Facebook a little bit is kind of like killed the golden goose because originally like the whole point of going on was you'd have this network effect of friends and family and now that's completely gone. So it's just like, what's, what does it do for you anymore? <laughs> so anyway, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. So just to qualify, I'm not, I don't consider myself a digital marketing strategist. What I consider me and my team is the creative, right? And so we don't do you know, we don't get into all of the details that a really good digital marketing team does. Um, we focus on, you know, how do I create a video that's going to not only get the views because you, anyone can pay to promote a crappy video. What we really pride ourselves in is how many shares it gets, how many comments it gets, what the engagement looks like. Um, but e even having said that, you know, we do definitely see that, it's a multi-platform approach now. So rather than just throwing everything on black, you know, you got to test different versions of your video. You've got to go on different platforms for retargeting. Whereas before, yeah, you could probably put the lion share in, you know, one category and just sit back from one video and, and see it take off.
Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So to kind of move it to, to your wheelhouse more than um, what is it about humor? You know, if it was, it was it scary niching to just funny videos where you're thinking what, you know, what about if I want to make a dramatic video or use some other emotion to get people, yeah. like, well, what is it about humor? Well, that that's a great point. And I, I still think it's not, we don't only do funny videos, but 90% of our videos right now are funny just because it's worked so well. Um, it's also something that if you have the right team, you can repeat it over and over again and pretty be pretty confident that you're going to get similar results. Whereas, you know, the other emotions, you know, tear jerkers or scary or other kinds of videos are much harder to engineer. I don't know if that makes sense, but, you know, it's when we create a video, we have a process that we go from beginning to end and we have, you know, the right kinds of writers. So, you know, marketing copywriters, creative storytellers, and then comedians going through those different phases of the scripting process. It, it's it's a pretty much proven formula by now that we can rely that we're going to come out with a result that we pre feel pretty confident is going to you know bring the results that the clients want. Whereas other kinds of videos, I'm sure there's other companies that have you know have got a process for that. Yeah, and, and I definitely want to dig into that that formula and get to get the, the specifics on it. Um, before I forget, one thing that jumped out at me is you mentioned hiring comedians, which is which is different than, than what I remember from the video space. I remember hiring writers and directors and all that. But how, how do uh, how do the comedians fit into the pie? Well, so your viewers can download my free ebook at funnysalesvideos.com that goes through all eight steps because adding comedy, you know, people always want to get right to that. But there's no point doing that unless you've gone and laid the foundation. It's kind of like saying, you know, let's focus on hiring a great roofer when you haven't done, done the foundations. If you don't know why it should be funny or how it should be funny or who you're trying to make funny, then you've wasted your money. You know, if I was to create a joke for a, you know, AARP audience, a senior citizens, that's going to be a completely different mindset than if I'm creating a video for tweens. And so you've got to be relevant. You've also got to be furthering the sale with your comedy. You can't just throw out jokes for the sake of being funny. You've got to create a story around which somebody has a problem that your solution solves and then present uh, an irresistible offer that's going to get action. We're not creating videos that are funny for the sake of funny. funny we're creating videos that are going to drive action, whether that's an e-commerce sale, whether that's a lead generation, whether that's, you know, any other number of actions that you're taking. So with all that said, and again, you can read the first three steps in my ebook, but the fourth, fourth step is adding comedy. And the way that we do it is we simply reach out to comedians. And by now we've got a great group that we work with consistently. But, you know, if you're listening and thinking, you know, we've done video before and, you know, it's it's worked or it's mediocre and we want to up our game. The best way to add comedy is not to try to do it yourself. Right. Most people, unless, you know, unless you're a trained stand up comic or a trained comedy writer, you know, it's best to leave that to the experts so, you know, getting a brain share of really clever writers and you can find them online. There's a lot of online freelance services that have creative comedy writers that will work for you. Or you can go to your local comedy clubs and listen to stand up comedians and approach them afterwards and ask them if they'd be interested in freelancing for you. But the key is to get very clever comedians and get multiple so no one person is going to be able to write your script. We always say it takes a village. Most of our videos, you know, have been touched by 20 people before they reach the, the YouTube or the Facebook page. And so, you know, testing these jokes on each other, but then also testing them on your customer avatar to make sure, like I said, that that specific demographic thinks it's funny before you waste money going into production with a script that hasn't been tested. Yeah, I, I love that. And it's, it's super interesting to me because like when you think about other types of, of art, especially like written art, like novels and movies, um, there's something about the solo artists like toiling away. Well, what is it about comedy that requires a village? 
I think it's just the it's a numbers game. Uh, and again, you know, if you're a stand up comic, you know, like a Jerry Seinfeld or a Brian Regan, you know, most of those are you know, the solo artist. Um, I don't know. Maybe some of them have had people that help write their material for them. But when you're going into something where a client is going to potentially invest a lot of money to promote that video, you don't want to risk it. You want to you want the wisdom of the crowd. And it's it's about throwing out as many story point points, but also jokes and then whittling it down to the best. So typically just to come up with a concept for a video, we'll throw out 50 different ideas on the board, right? Before we whittle it down to the best five, and then we test them and go with the one that we think is the best. Same with jokes. We'll, you know, most of our jokes, even the best jokes will end up on the cutting room floor because they're either not funny enough or they're not relevant enough. You could have the funniest joke, but if it distracts from the end goal, which is a sale, you have to cut it. And that requires a ton of jokes. So maybe, you know, we'll, we'll have a hundred potential jokes and 10 of them will make the script. And so the more writers you have on your team, the more you have the option to create those hundred jokes and just settle for the 10 that are the best rather than, you know, hire one comedian that will maybe, you know, throw out 20 jokes and you keep half of them. Yeah. I've, I've heard a lot about that, that before from just comedians talking that it takes a massive amount of quantity to whittle down the kind of like, exactly. like building, building a sculpture out of clay. So that, that makes sense. Um, I guess one question I have is like, I remember, you know, selling animated videos and it was, the, they weren't, they weren't even necessarily funny or edgy, but we would always get people that would come in and say, I wouldn't want it to go viral. I want to want to do these, these things. I want it to be crazy. And nine times out of 10, they, they were not willing to do what it, what it would take. You know, they were not willing to yep. entertain anything that was truly edgy. So I'd love yep. to hear your, your experience with that. You know, have you, have you come up with that problem? How do you qualify clients to actually figure out if they're willing to what you do? what you need to do to be funny? <laughs> like, how, how do you go through that process? Yeah. So I always kind of take people back in time to the scenario of the Harmon brothers who came up with what I think still is one of the most successful viral style videos of all time, which is the Squatty Party, the pooping unicorn. So the story goes that the Harmon brothers were, were brought in to Squatty Party before any of this happened. And they pitched them that idea and this board basically said, no, there's no way we would put our brand out there with a squat, with a unicorn that poops multicolored ice cream, right? That's just ridiculous. And so they rejected it. And a year later, when sales were lagging, they were like, oh, maybe, maybe we should give that a try. And so I always tell my clients when we come up with ideas, I say, don't kill your unicorns too quickly. Be open to crazy ideas. Now, they can't be so crazy that they are to the detriment of the brand. You can't offend people, at least not the masses. You can't do something that you know makes your company look bad, but you have to be disruptive. So before we ever take on a client, we always tell them, we're going to push this. This is going to be like nothing you've ever done before. But if you want the results that you've never had before, you've got to do something to get those results that you've never done before. So pretty much all of our clients, when they hire us, they understand we're pushing this and we're gonna do something completely disruptive and you just gotta trust the process. And if you're trying to do this then yourself, same thing, be open to the fact that to get the results that you've never got before, you have to go down roads that you've never gone down before. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. So it sounds like, you know, there, there's a fine line between disruptive offending people or being ineffectual. Do you think that line has changed since you've been doing this over the last 20 plus years? Well, so to qualify, we've only been doing this for about four or five years, right? 20 years ago is when we started the production company. Um, has it changed? Yeah, sure. It's changed for some people, but I think f for us, we always try to take the high road. I always use the analogy of comedy. Um, there are comedians that are very, very funny that, you know, have gutter trashy comedy, right? They'll tell the dirty jokes. They'll tell, you know, the pol politically incorrect racist jokes. And to me, it's not easy, but it's kind of the easy road. 
it's much harder to do good, clean comedy because again, you've got to filter out all of the stuff. Like when we come up with ideas, you know, we definitely come up with ideas and our team comes up with ideas that are funny, but too racy. And we have to say, you know, we want, we want our comedy, we want our videos to be, you know, family friendly and appeal to everyone rather than, you know, a certain niche. And that, by definition, is much harder because you've got to reject a lot more stuff. So has back to your question, has it changed for everyone? Probably for us, no. I think we kind of uh, drew a line in the sand and said, we'll always kind of be playing in this space. And that's where we think is the safest for brands. But also, you know, we, we want our videos to be the kind of videos that anyone can watch. Plus, yeah. add, add, add to that, the algorithms, you know, Facebook and YouTube, they'll reject stuff if you if you make it too edgy. Um, I mean, you probably know this. There's all kinds of rules and regulations that Facebook plays by now that your ads can't do certain things or else they'll just be rejected but at the ad account level. Right. And I think the other the other benefit is the content you're creating ends up being timeless in a way, because a lot of times the dirty stuff is is very uh, of the moment and, and so on. So, yeah, I think that, that's that's a good point. Um to, to completely shift gears a bit, I'd love to just kind of get into what your day to day is like, you know, running uh, a business like this and everything, given that a lot of our audience are boutique agency owners and like others in the marketing creative world and so on. So what so, you know, you're, you're doing, it sounds like a lot of productions, uh, a lot, a lot of you know, creativity managing teams. How do you typically balance your time between that and, and new business? Do you have a sales team? Like, what does that look like for you? So the biggest blessing of doing what we do is, you know, by its nature, it is viral, right? So when we do a campaign for somebody, it spreads to tens of millions of views in some cases. And so we right now have more clients than we can handle. We don't have any salespeople. We simply have a list of clients that have filled out the form on our website. And the great thing is we get to pick and choose which, which clients we work with and which projects we take on. And so from a sales point of view, no, we, yeah, it's, it's pretty much a funnel that creates itself because every time we launch a new campaign, you know, clients will ask that client, Hey, who did that video? And so we get a lot of word of mouth off of that. As far as the operations, you know, that's really where I, I, I love to play. And so I kind of see myself as, you know, most, and we're a pretty small agency, just put that out there. So I manage, you know, a team of writers, um, a production team, and then the post-production process. And so, you know, my day-to-day -day is, it could be anything from, you know, like last week, two of the days last week, I was on set filming um, a campaign for True Earth, which is one of our biggest clients that uh, the one that I mentioned that has 70 million views between the first two, we just launched um, a video for them last week. That's already within just a couple, three, four days has like 3 million views and has brought their cost per customer way, way down. So, you know, I'm on set filming, um, I'm supervising our editors, whether that's, you know, audio engineers or color correction or, you know, editors or, or I'm, you know, working with script writers, reviewing scripts. I kind of oversee the whole process. Um, and so every day is different, right? Today, I'm going to be reviewing scripts that my team has been working on last week while I was on production, um, you know, green lighting different stages. So we'll go from concepting to scripting to the comedy part and then on to production where we audition actors, find locations. Um, so really every single day is completely different. Yeah, that sounds great. So it sounds like you're, you get to do what, you know, what's the, the, the fun stuff and everything. And to backtrack a little bit, you know, how did that compare to when you were running kind of a more agnostic video production company and what, what made you decide to, to, to really niche to that, to this space? Uh, great question. So back then, we either were working on very, very big projects like a 30 minute long infomercial, or we were working on the complete opposite. Very, very short, simple sales videos that weren't really scripted. We would send you know, teams into a company to interview their CEO and a couple of their customers and then shoot some B-roll. And you know, within a three or four days, the video was, was finished. Nowadays, the funny sales videos, the thing I love 
but it's also a challenge is that it takes way longer. So our average video takes anywhere between three and six months to produce simply because, you know, we're spending at least two months to script it and then about a month to audition and find locations. The actual filming is the shortest part, you know, two to three days for most of our videos and then about a month of post-production. Um, if there's heavy visual effects, that could be longer. So it's a much longer process um, than our simple videos that we used to do, but it's so much more rewarding because number one, they're so much more effective as I've mentioned from previous results. Um, but also I just love to watch the comments and shares and people reacting to these videos in a way that none of our videos have had ever got in my first 15 years in the business. So it's a lot more rewarding because even if you don't make an immediate sale, people are laughing, people are enjoying it. People are connecting with your brand on a way that they never did in the, in the old versions of our videos. Right. Right. That makes sense. So there's a few, a few jumping off points there. Um, I guess the first one is like, what, what are you seeing to, to work really well? Like, I know you, there's, there's a formula you guys use, there's the eight steps, but between the video, your most successful videos and the less successful videos, what, what do you think that thing is? Well, to be completely honest with you, it depends on the client that's promoting it. So some of, I'll give you two examples. One is the True Earth example where they have 70 million views on two videos and, you know, millions of dollars in sales. And then I have another client who's a one man band selling a pain relief device. And, you know, his video, I think I spoke to our digital agency last week that's promoting that is almost hit half a million views. So, you know, completely different results, but he's doubled his sales. And so percentage wise, according to the size of his company, he's actually doing better than the company True Earth that has done 70 million views. And so the difference is simply, you know, what are you, what are you willing to put behind the video in, in terms of ad dollars to promote it? And so this, this small company just couldn't keep up with the growth if they promoted it the way that this larger company does. And so I personally don't think that the creative on those two campaigns are that much different as far as how effective the creative is. It's just the digital strategy that's promoting those two videos. One is dialed up to 100 and one's dialed down to keep up with, you know, sustainable growth. Yeah, it makes sense that it would, that it would be based on, on what they can put behind it to a large degree. I guess to, to rephrase that question a little, what, what are you most proud of? What videos have you made that you're, you're most proud of? So I'm most proud of the videos that we make that do good in the world, right? I, over the past, you know, first 15 years of some, uh, somewhat questionable, you know, infomercials that sell products that, yeah, is that really going to benefit your life? Um, it's really great to get behind products and, and companies that genuinely are solving a great problem and that have, you know, characters that we can build that connect to people on a deeper level than just, you know, buy this widget right? This is how it's going to help your life. And so products like True Earth, who are mission-driven companies that are helping to reduce waste in the world, which is basically what their product does. It's a laundry detergent that comes in compostable packaging that doesn't have plastic bottles that are filling up the landfill. I mean, that connects on, on a deeper level with people and by its very mission-driven nature, is gonna be accelerated by people wanting to share it and wanting to, you know, look like they're helping promote a great cause. And so those are the kinds of projects that I'm really proud of that aren't just making people money, but that are helping, you know, people, whether it's, you know, save the planet or other products that are genuinely helping people reduce their pain or other ways that, you know, our creativity is being put to a better use than just dollars and cents. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. And to, to kind of hopscotch back to, um, back to operations, cause it sounds like that's something that you focus on a lot and have thought a lot about. I think one of the toughest things with like any complex marketing project is onboarding, you know, what information do we give to the client? When, what information do we need from them? Who on their side is involved? Who on our side is involved? When are they involved? So I'd love to hear your take on that. Like how do you guys typically handle onboarding? That, yeah, that's a great question because I kind of, you know, this may not be the answer that 
that all of your clients can use, but maybe if they're smaller boutique agencies like us, what I do is I really focus on interviewing the client and making sure that A, that they have a great product that serves a great need that has a clearly definable target audience and, and that has social proof that people already are using it, are liking it. And then what I do is I basically tell the client in most of the time, you know, we take them through a, a process where we say, you got to trust us. Just let us do our thing. We'll come back to you with our five best ideas. Then once we give them their our five best ideas, you know, high level of the campaign, you know, here's, here's the character and here's the solution that he has. Then together we'll kind of brainstorm and pick the best one. And then I kind of tell them, you know, we're going to go dark for about a month. Just trust us that in a month we're going to come back with a script that we think is really going to do justice to this video. And it's amazing. I used to have clients that were very nitpicky, that wanted to be in the details, that wanted to, you know, really guide the process. And I've had to step back and say, you got to trust us. You got to trust the process. And even when we come back with the scripts at the end, some clients are like, oh, that's so different than what we've done before. Again, I tell them, you've got to trust us. You've got to trust the process. And so we will go months without really having a lot of interaction with the client at times. But I've yet to have a client that has told us to go back to step one, if that makes sense. And, and so just, just showing the client before we ever start, here's the finished product, right? Here's 10 examples that you can see on our, our website of videos that have got into the millions. I think that gives us some credibility to begin with. But having said that, sometimes I'll break all of those rules uh, and I'll, I'll skip steps and I'll say, give us two months because I just have an idea that if I was to tell it to you, it wouldn't make sense. I want to go out and produce something. For example, literally right now, I'm working on a music video. So it's a little bit different than most of the videos, but you can't tell a client, here are the lyrics and try to imagine in your mind how this will be sung with music and with you, yeah. you just can't you can't get approval at that stage. So I'm completely skipping over that. And I'm investing my money up front to hire, you know, a music producer and singers to sing the song so that they can listen to it. Then they get the vision and they'll buy off. So I don't know that that answers your question in a pragmatic way, but sometimes you just have to go with your gut. And other times you've got to say, no, the client needs buy off on this stage. No, I, th I think that's that's really great. And I, I love it because it maps so much with our experience where so much of it is just about expectation setting. And I think you hit on something really key, which is you told clients, look, this is going to be outside your comfort zone, but you got to trust the process. And we we are, you know, we do that in the context of creating sales messaging where, you know, like we might be writing email templates to do like sales outreach for clients. And one, one game changer for us is we just created a slide or two in our onboarding presentation. And we said, look, this is going to be outside your comfort zone. Here's the type of feedback that's good for us. Here's the type of feedback we don't like. And from that, we pretty much like eradicated revisions, you know, just from, yeah. just from saying that. And it's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So. But, but, but you, you've probably got track records to be able to say, you know, this is what we've done. So trust us that we can do it with you. Whereas somebody starting out, you may have a bit of a harder time with that kind of a, you know, slide in your deck. Sure, that's true, but but ultimately, you know, they've paid you for for coming up with these ideas, and I, I think that almost anybody, if they if they're in that position, could probably just just do that a little bit better. So I think that's that's a really great point. Um, yeah, and, and with that, you know, I think kind of kind of getting getting towards the end of our time. I just uh, yeah, where can people get in touch with you and, and get the ebook? And it sounds like if they go there, you know, they even if they never hire you, they're going to be able to get a great framework for just putting together this yeah. formula and, and doing it. Yeah. Yeah, and the reason why we have the ebook is we turn away more clients than we accept. And so we want to give those clients something that they can either do themselves or take to another production company to do. So you can download that ebook. It's called How to Make a Funny Sales Video Without Hiring Us. Go to funnysalesvideos.com. On that same page, you can watch previous examples of our work, but scroll all the way down to the bottom and you'll see it. Uh, the other way that, you know, if you've enjoyed this podcast, 
please subscribe to my podcast where we go into a lot more detail on each one of these subjects. And we also interview, um, there's an interview from both the companies, the case studies that I mentioned earlier, plus others, um, where we really find out how did these companies make these videos that quote unquote look like they went viral. And you can find that at any podcast service, how to make a video go viral. Um, and then you can you know follow our journey. Awesome. Joseph, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's been fun.